We are here with Arthi Mani, who is an engineering manager at Chan Zuckerberg Inst Initiative. She works in the science division. I'm sure she'll tell you all about herself. So I'm going to just hand the mic over to her and say, welcome, Arthi. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited to, to be here today. Um, so yeah, so my name is Arthi. I am an engineering manager at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative Foundation. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you today uh, a little bit about how we build uh, multidisciplinary teams um, at CZI. Um, before I start, I just wanted to say, uh, please pop your questions, comments into the chat, into the QA. I love to kind of get that feedback. Um, I won't be able to quite see the questions with the way my setup is, but I'm going to try to end a little bit early and then get to all of the questions at the end. So please, I, I love an interactive session. I'm kind of sad that I can't see all of you. So please go ahead and you know, use the chat, use the Q&A. All right, a little bit about myself and my team. Um, so I've been at CZI for a little over four years. I started out as a software engineer and then transitioned into engineering management. And I lead the single cell engineering team. So um, trying to, I'll, I'll try to make sure I get to all of the jargon, but at a very high level, single cell biology is the study and analysis of genomics, which is, comes from DNA, proteomics, which comes from proteins, and uh, transcriptomics, which comes from RNA at the um, individual cell level. And right now our focus is primarily on transcriptomics, which is the study of RNA. Um, before coming to CZI, I didn't know really a lick of biology. Um, my background is in computer science through and through. And so, you know, anytime I talk about science today, I really have to thank my, my team um, for being patient with me, with um, teaching me so much about um, cellular biology. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to share a few photos of my team. We actually just came back from a week um, in San Francisco. Our team is actually primarily remote, half on the West Coast, half on the East Coast. Um, and it comprised of many, many different disciplines. Um, we have folks who have a PhD in molecular biology, um, people who have a background in physics, uh, folks like me who come from a computer science background. Uh, and we come together to try and build um, and bring together science and technology in a way that really accelerates um, science forward. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our mission and vision, just as a backdrop to have as a um, uh, to have as a backdrop for all of the conversations uh, forward. So CZI's science mission is to cure, manage, and prevent all disease by the end of the century. So we are very ambitious. Um, and then one of the things I love about CZI is we're doing something a little bit unusual by pairing together science and technology. Um, a lot of groups in the science world um, are primarily kind of academic labs, or they might be part of the biotech industry, um, which, which tend to be for profit. And the cool thing about where I work, um, about the CZI Foundation, is that we are a nonprofit foundation. So all of the software that we build is... Um, really focused on trying to accelerate the um, cutting edge work that a lot of the academic labs are doing where technology can really help make that go faster, make their workflows go faster. And we build everything um, as open source software. We don't um, sell it or anything like that. And so I think it makes for a, a really unique organization um, with a diverse set of uh, folks who are trying to all kind of push this vision forward. Um, and then the single cell mission is to create knowledge about what are the mechanisms at the individual cell level that cause human disease. Um, and then by uh, making that knowledge uh, accessible and available for all scientists to then accelerate the generative generation of curative treatments. Um, our vision is to create a, a reference of human biology. So um, our goal is to try and sequence all of the different cell types in the human body um, and make that data accessible for anyone to use and then also pair it with visualization tools to enable, you know, biologists and physicians who may not know how to work with big data um, to be able to quickly get insights out of um, different cell types and to understand the cause of each disease. Um, so we have a very kind of big mission and vision, very much rooted in the science. Um, and we, we do have a multidisciplinary team to try and push this forward. 
Um, I'm actually going to just jump to the punchline of this entire presentation because I want you to have this, um, this notion in your head as you're listening to me speak. But I think the key thing about um, what makes for a successful multidisciplinary team is all about empathy. Um, it's this idea that um, if you can come, if you can try to understand where other people are coming from, to try to understand their culture, to understand their background a little bit and walk a mile in their shoes. Um, if every person on your team does that, it's what creates cohesion. It's what creates um, a, you know, a better environment from which you can have discussions and make decisions and really push, um, push something forward. Uh, and create something that is, you know, bigger than the sum of its parts. So um, I hope you keep this in mind uh, as I continue to talk throughout this presentation. So I want to talk a little bit about the challenges first. Um, and I also want to state, I, I know that not everyone here is working in a very, very like science focused domain. Um, but I do think probably all of you all have been working with at least one individual that comes from a different background than you. Um, it could be as simple as just engineering and product management or engineering and design or, you know, any kind of combination. Um, so, so I hope you kind of get a little bit um, out of this presentation, even if the scope of the multidisciplinary work isn't as broad as it is um, at CZI. Um, in order to achieve our mission, uh, for every single project, we may have um, individual that come from upwards of five specialties. Um, so they could come from engineering, product management, user experience research, product design, computational biology, uh, product analytics. So many different specialties that are all involved into making one project successful. And I kind of see three different uh, challenges that can manifest. So one is that each uh, specialty can come from, can have a different sense of what is important to them. So what are their culture and values? Uh, and they may not recognize what that other specialties culture or values might be. There might be just like general lack of awareness about what the different what the differences are. And the second thing is around language barriers um, that can result in miscommunication. Um, as somebody coming from tech, I think I often will accidentally use a lot of tech jargon. Uh, forgetting that not everyone in the room uh, might necessarily know what I'm talking about. I definitely felt like that when I first joined CZI and, you know, a word uh, like transcriptomics, I would sit there and be like, I, I don't know what that means. So, um, you know, it, it happens very often where you sit in a room and somebody's speaking and you don't quite understand exactly um, what they've said because we're so used to using uh, our own jargon. Um, and then the last little bit is that the responsibilities at the intersection of the specialties can be a little bit murky. So um, when two uh, specialties need to collaborate very, very closely together, it can be sometimes a little bit difficult to understand who does what. Um, and I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes going through a specific example, kind of demonstrating two ways that building this particular tool um, where we had some of those challenges. So I'm going to switch over to um sharing another tab which i hope you all can see um so this is a tool that enables folks to um to understand what are the, the different cell types in any um, tissue and uh, what are the genes that make that cell type unique so in the spirit of um international women's day let's pick a very cool uh tissue the uterus you can see here all of the different cell types in the uterus. Uterus is also an incredibly cool muscle. Um, that's what enables it to um, expand from the size of a lemon to the size of a watermelon. And I'm gonna add all of the marker genes to this plot. So marker genes are genes that are specifically unique to that particular cell type, which in this case, I picked a muscle cell. Um, so you can see a plot rendered here. And if you're a scientist, you can start to understand, ah, these genes are specifically unique. Um, and there are certain genes um, that, that may not be unique or are prevalent in other cell types. Um, and so some of the challenges in getting this tool out the door. Um, so one thing was figuring out the algorithm to actually compute this. So we actually had a computational biologist who went out into um, the field, did some literature research. Um, to understand what the algorithm should be. 
Um, but then ultimately it was a software engineer who actually implemented it. And so there was a kind of a discussion about like who owns this algorithm moving forward, who owns the, um, the writing of it, but then the long-term maintenance of it. Um, like, how does that exactly work? And even trying to figure out who writes the first draft of the algorithm was a point of discussion. Another kind of um, discussion that happened is, when was this good enough to ship? Um, when was it good enough to you know, remove the feature flag and make it available for all scientists to use? We had very different perspectives from a, our computational, fo computational biology folks um, saying, oh, we need to kind of validate this against scientific literature to make sure we're not accidentally um, uh, you know, making bad science available. We had product managers who were kind of in the middle saying we should validate it for you know, certain popular um, cell types, but don't need to do it kind of comprehensively for every single one. And then you had engineers who were like, well, the unit test passed, the smoke test passed, we're good to go and let's ship it. So we had very, very different um, uh, you know, theories on when this was good enough to ship. All right, um, and then kind of going back to the presentation. Uh, so how do we get over this? I think, you know, number one thing is culture building. And um, there are different aspects of culture building. So one of the things I really love about CZI is the clarity in our unifying mission and vision. I think having that vision and mission is what sets the groundwork to have productive disagreements because it kind of gives the team confidence that everyone in the room has the same why behind their work. So I think, um, you know, as a leader, if, if you are in the position of being a leader, but I also think, you know, even if you are, um, if you're not, you want to be able to repeat and rearticulate this mission as, as often as possible and make sure that everyone really understands it. If you, if you have the same why, that's, that's your common great, that's your common framework and you have a, you know, a baseline. I think establishing a strategy is the kind of second thing. A strategy should be clear, easy to understand. I think at the start of developing that strategy, you should make sure you have generative conversations where people have a voice and have an input into the strategy. And I think it should happen across all different levels. Um, and then ultimately when that decision is made on what the strategy is, it's okay to say like not everyone, um, not everyone may agree with the approach, but it is important that people disagree and commit. And it kind of goes back to setting that groundwork um, so that if people understand the why and what our approach is going to be, then you have at least a baseline from which you all can start discussion. And then the last thing is around team values. Um, I think establishing and intentionally establishing team values is incredibly important. Um, it helps keep everyone on the same page in terms of how we want to work and what do we care about the things we build. I think the conversation about what is good enough to ship um, was a great conversation to have. And out of that came kind of a set of values um, from which other projects can use to say, ah, like this team did it, you know, established this particular values or the set of values for what is good enough to ship. We can kind of borrow that and move that forward for future projects. The next thing is around expectation management. Um, I think it is really important to spend the time to kind of define roles and responsibilities. Um, and then in this kind of remote working environment, documenting them is, is really important to kind of alleviate any issues around uh, miscommunication. Um, and then even once you have that at a high level, establishing who does what um, ahead of a project is, is really important. Um, the conversations around who develops the algorithm and who does the maintenance of it um, was very productive to have, even if we had it a little bit later in the project, once we actually stumbled across that, um, that, that blocker. Once you have that and documenting it, people are on the same page, uh, that can really help in, in fostering a positive team culture. Um, and then if you're not sure who should do it, I, I really think that people should feel empowered to try it themselves and really feel ownership over the, over the project that they're, do, they're, they're working on. Um, and that kind of goes to the punchline of once you've actually established all of these roles and responsibilities and who's doing what, then find opportunities to cross the lines and break the rules. Um, you know, be thoughtful about how the way, the way that you do it. Um, you know, you should have the conversations with, with folks from other disciplines, but 
Um, it's a great way to build empathy and to understand the culture and the perspective of somebody else by kind of stepping over the line a little bit. And for example, in this case, having a software engineer develop an algorithm or implement an algorithm that is from scientific literature. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is communication. And this is kind of, I'm going to talk about things that are a little bit very much tactical here. Um, one thing that we did at CZI recently is um, delete all Slack channels that were created for specific specialties and only have Slack channels that are for whole projects or whole teams. And the reason that we did that is that I, I really believe that you can create, um, you can really foster cross-pollination and the sharing of ideas. So we had a Slack channel previously just for computational biology where they were sharing papers, but now it goes into a broader team channel where you know, folk, engineers and product managers and designers all have the opportunity to see um, what papers, what scientific papers a computational biolog biologist thought were interesting and take an attempt and, and try to read it. Um, and then, you know, in my role as, a, as an engineering manager, as I develop goals for, for my reports, creating incentive structures for individuals to learn about other domains is really important. So um, making sure that it becomes part of their goals, making sure that they have the time to go and try and read a, um, a paper or go and attend a scientific conference. I think making space for that is incredibly important. And again, kind of go, goes back to building that um, sense of empathy. Um, so I'm going to try and quickly uh, wrap up here, but uh, I, I hope you heard this throughout the presentation, this kind of focus on empathy and trying to build that in many different ways um, as much as possible throughout your entire team. I think that this really is the key aspect of building a successful multidisciplinary team. So with that, thank you so much for, for listening. And I'm going to switch over to try to see what's in the Q&A and chat and answer some questions. I love, I love the comments here. Um, very, very cool. Background in clinical data management and um, program management. That's, that's awesome. Well, thank you all so much. It's, thank you so much for the, um, the interaction. I'm so sorry that I, uh, you know, it's not face to face. It'd be so cool. But um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Arthi. That was an excellent talk. <clears throat> All right, we're going to break now and go to employer booths. We have Autodesk, Cadence, Dematic, United States Digital Service, and Coetzee in employer booths. If you go back to look at the schedule, you can click on the link to go to a booth, or you can go to the navigation to the top and click on employer booths and just find them there. They'll be there for the next hour till 1 p.m. Pacific. And yeah, thank you so much again. All right. See you at one for the keynote. All right. Bye.